Last week, I installed a framework for us to try to better comprehend not only what we have learned this far in the Gospels about Yeshua's role in redemption history, but also about the several stages of it. And that beginning in Matthew 24 in particular, so very much of what Jesus says is about things in the far future to his era. And these future things are what in modern times we refer to as the end times, and scholars call the study of these same future things that we all think about eschatology. Now, part of the point of the discussion was to draw our attention to the reality that redemption does indeed have a history and that Jesus' activities are directly involved only in part of it. Further, that redemption is a process. It's not an event, and it does have a known and definable beginning and end. The beginning came upon Adam and Eve's rebellion against God and thus committing the first sin. So was born the need for redemption. The long process ends only upon the destruction of the current universe along with the earth we presently live upon, and with it the recreation of a new system to form a dynamic that has never before existed, a dynamic in which all barriers between creatures and creator are erased, in which evil and its leader are eliminated, and therefore Sin and decay and death become impossibilities. Now, I will be incorporating a number of prophecies from the biblical prophets that in most cases, Yeshua will be referring to in his own prophecies that are not attempting to be disguised as new ones or replacements for the originals. Rather, he will be adding information, clarification, and context, much like John does in the book of Revelation, about what was long ago spoken and written down. I will also be speaking about application and some church doctrines that I think are misguided and can lead us into chasing our tails instead of running after the truth. So, open your Bibles with me to Matthew chapter 2. 24. Matthew chapter 24, and we're going to read the entire chapter together. Matthew chapter 24. <clears throat> As Yeshua left the temple and was going away, his Talmudim, his disciples came and called his attention to its buildings. But he answered them, you see all these. Well, yes, I tell you, they will be totally destroyed. Not a single stone will be left standing. And when he was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the Talmudim came to him privately. Tell us, they said, when will these things happen? What will be the sign that you are coming, that the Olam Hazeh is ending? Yeshua replied, watch out, don't let anyone fool you. For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Messiah, and they will lead many astray. <clears throat> you will hear the noise of wars nearby, the news of wars far off. See to it that you don't become frightened. Such things must happen, but the end is yet to come. For peoples will fight each other, nations will fight each other, and there will be famines and earthquakes in various parts of the world. All this is but the beginnings of the birth pangs. At that time, you will be arrested, handed over to be punished, put to death, and all peoples will hate you because of me. At that time, many will be trapped into betraying and hating each other. Many false prophets will appear and fool many people, and many people's love will grow cold because of increased distance from Torah. But whoever holds out until the end will be delivered. And this good news about the kingdom will be announced throughout the whole world as a witness to all the goyim, to all the nations. 
it is then that the end will come. So, when you see the abomination that causes desolation spoken about through the prophet Daniel, standing in the holy place, place, let the reader understand the illusion, that will be the time for those in Judah to escape to the hills. If someone is on the roof, he must not go down to gather his belongings from his house. If someone's in the field, he must not turn back to get his coat. What a terrible time it will be for pregnant women, for nursing mothers. Pray that you won't have to escape in the winter or on Shabbat. For there will be trouble then, worse than there has ever been from the beginning of the world until now. There will never be anything like it again. Indeed, if the length of this time had not been limited, no one would survive. But for the sake of those who've been chosen, its length will be limited. At that time, if someone says to you, look, there's the Messiah, there he is, don't believe him. For there will appear the false messiahs and false prophets performing great miracles, amazing things, so as to even fool the chosen. Possible. There, I told you in advance. So if people say to you, listen, he's out in the desert, don't go. Or look, he's hidden away in a secret room, don't believe it. For when the Son of Man does come, it'll be like lightning that flashes out of the east and fills the sky to the western horizon. Wherever there's a dead body, that's where you'll find the vultures. But immediately following the trouble of those times, the sun will grow dark, the moon will stop shining, the stars will fall from the sky, the powers in heaven will be shaken. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky and all the tribes of the land will mourn and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with tremendous power and glory. And he'll send out his angels with a great shofar and they will gather together his chosen people from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. Now, let the fig tree teach you a lesson. When its branches begin to sprout and leaves appear, you know that summer is approaching. In the same way, when you see all these things, you are to know that the time is near right at the door. Yes, I tell you that this people will certainly not pass away before all these things happen. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. But when that day and hour will come, no one knows, not the angels in heaven, not the Son, only the Father. For the Son of Man's coming will be just as it was in the day of Noah. Back then, before the flood, people went on eating and drinking, taking wives, becoming wives, right up until the day Noah entered the ark and they didn't know what was happening until the flood came and swept them all away. It'll be just like that when the Son of Man comes. Then there will be two men in a field. One will be taken and the other left behind. There will be two women grinding flour at the mill. One will be taken and the other left behind. So stay alert. You don't know on what day your Lord will come, but you do know this. Had the owner of the house known when the thief was coming, he would have stayed awake, not allowed his house to be broken into. Therefore, you too must always be ready, for the Son of Man will come when you're not expecting him. Who is the faithful and sensible servant whose master puts him in charge of the household staff to give them their food at the proper time. It will go well with that servant if he is found doing his job when the master comes. Yes, I tell you that he will put him in charge of all he owns, but if that servant's wicked, and he says to himself, oh, my master's taking his time, and he starts beating up his fellow servants, spreads his time eating and drinking with drunkards, then his master will come on a day that servant doesn't expect, a time he doesn't know, and he will cut him in two and put him with the hypocrites where people will wail and grind their teeth.
The general nature of Matthew chapter 24 presents Yeshua as a prophet in the sense of one who can see the future. Now, what can be so demanding of us is to decipher the meaning of the things he says as it pertains to when these things are to happen. Are they only connected to Yeshua's era? Are they only just a few more years away, such as in Paul's day? Or are they only to take, some place in, take place in some very distant and unclear future? We have learned in the many earlier Torah class lessons in both the Old and New Testaments that one of the attributes of Old Testament prophecy is that prophesied events tend to happen somewhat immediately and then happen again at a later time and sometimes yet again at a far later time. The tendency is for Bible scholars and commentators to kind of pick and choose from an either-or mindset as to which of these prophesied events is the actual prophesied event, while the other fulfillment-like events are coincidences or contrived look-alikes. Now, as hard as it can be for us, and especially for those listening who are either seminary or theological school students, we must recalibrate our thinking about the realities of prophetic fulfillments to match what the scriptures tell us versus what our vast array of Christian denominational doctrines tell us. And as of late, there are also many works of fiction about the end times that further muddies the waters of our thinking on the subject. See, these fictional works can sometimes become mixed together with what the Bible says. And so sometimes believers can think that whatever is portrayed in those novels is an accurate account of what will happen and how end times events will look. I mean, for example, the rapture. Oh, that's a good one. This mysterious event is in modern times, most popularly, depicted as believers suddenly flying up to the air, apparently naked, with their clothing fluttering back down to earth, or left behind neatly folded from the place they were launched. Could this be true? I can't say it's impossible, but the Bible certainly does not suggest the nature of the rapture is this. Rather, this kind of portrayal comes from the fertile imaginations of writers. And the unintended consequence is that this is how many evangelical Christians so smitten by these books honestly think that the Bible tells us that the rapture is going to occur. So if it doesn't happen like that, then many are going to not believe when it has occurred. Now, we, you, shouldn't feel alone or think this tendency to be misled is a new dynamic or that we are biblically uninformed about this dilemma. Christ himself has warned us about this. He has been openly challenging the doctrines and the beliefs of the Hebrew faith as it was currently being taught and enforced by the Jewish leadership of his day. He stood nearly alone in his resistance and in his reformation. And when I say doctrines, I mean it in the sense of the term as it is used in contemporary times as opposed to its technical sense. That is, doctrines is a list of faith principles established and believed by a group of humans said to be the proper interpretations of the Holy Bible with all of their interpretations being wrong. 
This is the same as what the Jews referred to as traditions. The primarily the primary shared characteristic of Jewish traditions and Christian doctrines is they're man-made. This is not to say that all traditions and doctrines are incorrect, but many are, and at times dangerously so. Often they are established with the result that God worshipers become divided up into segments, with each segment becoming loyal to a particular sect or denomination or leader. The bottom line is that much of what Yeshua is prophesying will happen both in or near his day and then again in the far future. Naturally, it was easier for the Jews of his day to grasp and mentally picture what the prophesied event will look like and how it could happen in their time versus what it could look like and happen in some unknowable distant future. It's the same for us. See, when we read about the end times and the apocalypse in Jesus' prophecies and John's and the book of Revelation, we subconsciously form a mental picture based on the context of how things currently are in our day, in this case, in the year 2021. And if these end times events were to happen within a decade or so, perhaps we have formed a pretty accurate mental picture. But if they were to happen beyond that relatively short time frame, then I promise you, that as we gather today, we have no real way of knowing what it's all going to look like. Or of the coming world-changing events, like the COVID pandemic, or the development of new, ever more intrusive technologies, or of the evolution of societies and national governments either towards extreme religion or extreme secularism, or of the waning and rising power of nations, or of what seems to be the never-ending and ever-increasing deadly cataclysms, and so much more. Yeshua spoke on that problem for us. If only we'll notice and heed his words. So I want you to listen carefully as Christ reveals the future and how we're to respond to it. So in verse 1, the location of what's been going on since about chapter 21 is going to change. So far, since Christ's arrival in Jerusalem, all is centered around the temple. Now, to be clear, not the temple in the sense of the actual sanctuary where the holy place and the holy of holies exist behind a huge veil but rather in the sense of the vast temple grounds where there were numerous places to meet and teach. This was Herod's temple. Herod the Great had spent enormous sums of money and many years totally remodeling and expanding the temple grounds as well as beautifying the temple sanctuary building. In Yeshua's time, the temple mount had grown to 35 acres or so. Now, while that may not seem so terribly large to us, in that day, it was monumental, and it was seen as one of the wonders of the world that wealthy Gentiles would travel long distances merely to marvel at its size and its magnificence. It was along his way to outside the city walls of Jerusalem then across the Kidron Valley to the Mount of Olives, the Christ's disciples sort of wondered out loud about the stunning nature of this temple and the Temple Mount. You know, they didn't really ask a question of their master. They weren't even necessarily looking for a lesson. It was only casual conversation as they strolled by. 
But Yeshua used the occasion to make a prophecy about the temple. Mark 13 and Luke 21 both report on this same conversation, making it clear that the disciples were specifically pointing out the enormous size and quantity of the minly fine and cut stones under the that, that were used in the construction of it. Yeshua's response, I'm afraid, put a damper on their enthusiasm. He says that the temple, meaning the sanctuary and the huge walls, the entire Temple Mount area, would not only be destroyed, it would be disassembled. It is mostly from his comment that the bulk of modern era Bible scholars and commentators conclude that the gospel writers must have put fake prophetic words into Christ's mouth. That is, these scholars claim that what the gospel writers did was to write well after the destruction of Jerusalem and the dismantling of those walls that would come in 70 AD, some 35 or so years after Yeshua spoke the prophecy. So the gospel writers are looking in hindsight back to when the temple was destroyed. So Jesus never actually said anything about the fate of the temple, but their words do make him look like a seer and a prophet. Now I want to pause here momentarily. While I know this can be so hard to accept, for followers of Messiah Yeshua. The unseemly truth is that some of what is written and taught about Christ in the Bible is seen by even somewhat conservative Bible scholars today as but fictional narrative added for effect. The same scholars that do so very well in translating the Greek into English and to other languages as well and agree that indeed this is what the earliest gospel texts that we have actually say to be true, don't themselves believe all the substance of it. So, for instance, they claim that all but the end times prophecies of Jesus that are meant for the far future are only fraudulent if well-intentioned claims by the gospel writers. They are writing about events that had already happened by their day. So they were able to put fake words into Christ's mouth that we could someday look back and marvel at what he seemed to foreknow. Now naturally, this conclusion filters down to seminaries, ultimately down to what is taught from a pulpit. In fact, Belief in the inspiration of the New Testament is on the wane. And so a newer trend is to take what comes in the gospel accounts prior to Yeshua's resurrection with a rather large grain of salt, and only what comes after it is to be taken more seriously. So let me state for the record that all of us at Seed of Abraham Ministries who teach believe that the Gospels are indeed the inspired Word of God. And that when we read of Christ prophesying, it was a true prophecy that was prophesied before the fact. The reality is that if this weren't so, then we all belong to a failed religion and we follow a false messiah. You just can't have it both ways. Well, about 35 years after Jesus' prophecy, the temple was indeed destroyed by the Romans and the stones of the walls disassembled. And with some recent excavations under what's called Robinson's Arch, there have been found hundreds of these enormous stones that had been pushed over the top of the Temple Mount uh, the foundation into heaps of rubble. Tourists have a full view of it today. Now, I highly recommend 
for study of the temple in its various stages and eras, perhaps the most extensive, up-to-date, and beautifully illustrated book that exists today. There's nothing like it. It is a Carta Publishers of Jerusalem book by Lean Rittmeyer called The Quest. Get it. There's not a lot of places where you can obtain it, but you can get it at holylandmarketplace.com. There's a little ad for you. So verse 3 moves us up to the Mount of Olives. After telling his disciples what's going on to happen, what, what's going to happen to the Temple Mount that they so admired, they naturally want to know what? When? When is this going to happen? Mark says it was only Peter, James, John, and Andrew that were sitting there with Christ at the moment asking the question of when? Now, before we address Yeshua's answer, make note that knowing what we know in our time with so much history in our rearview mirrors, and when considering especially Zechariah's and Ezekiel's and Jeremiah's prophecies of a new temple that's to come later, then this prophetic fulfillment of the temple's destruction must be taken in a rather typical fulfillment fashion. It happens and then it happens again in the future. In other words, Jesus is, not, is speaking not only of the, the second temple, Herod's temple being destroyed, but of a third one being built, and then it being desecrated and destroyed, or at least significantly damaged, in a far future time. In fact, later still, a fourth temple seems to be prophetically described by the prophets, one that comes during the Millennial Kingdom era. Whether this is a brand new temple or a reconstructed third temple, I'm not at all sure, because the Holy Scriptures don't give us enough definitive information about it. Now, as for the destruction of the third temple, something that does not yet exist, and of Jerusalem, we need to go to the 14th chapter of Zechariah. I'm going to read this to you starting at Zechariah 14, verse 1. Look, a day is coming for Adonai when your plundered Jerusalem will be divided right there within you. For I will gather all the nations against Jerusalem for war. The city will be taken. The houses will be rifled. The women will be raped. Half the city will go into exile. But the rest of the people will not be cut off from the city. Then Adonai will go out and fight against those nations, fighting as on a day of battle. On that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which lies to the east of Jerusalem. And on the Mount of Olives, it will split in half from the east to the west to make a huge valley. Half of the mountain will move towards the north, half of it towards the south. You will flee to the valley in the mountains, for the valley in the mountains will reach to Atzel. You will flee, just as you fled before the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. Then Adonai, my God, will come to you with all the holy ones. And on that day there will be neither bright light nor thick darkness. And one day, known to Adonai, will be neither day nor night, although by evening there will be light. On that day, fresh water will flow out from Jerusalem, half of it towards the eastern sea, half towards the western sea, both summer and winter. Then Adonai will be king over the whole world. And on that day, Adonai will be the only one, and his name will be the only name. Prophet Amos adds a little more to this. In Amos chapter 2, starting to read at verse 4, here is what Adonai says, For Judah's three crimes, no four, I will not reverse it because they rejected Adonai's Torah. They have not observed his laws, and their lies caused them to fall into error, to live the way their ancestors did. I will send fire upon Judah. It will consume the palaces of Jerusalem. Here is what Adonai says, for Israel's three crimes, no four, I will not reverse it, because they sell the upright for silver, and the poor for a pair of shoes. 
grinding the heads of the poor in the dust, pushing the lowly out of the way. Father and son sleep with the same girl, profaning my holy name, lying down beside any altar on clothes taken in pledge, drinking wine in the house of their God, bought with fines they imposed. See, these prophecies describe what happened to Jerusalem and the temple in Bible times to a degree, and what will happen again to a greater degree. We know that the Lord has not yet set foot on the Mount of Olives and split it in half. So this, of course, is future to us. Well, this provides a good example of how the prophets and the prophecies operate. In some ways, it helps us to understand them. In other ways, it can make the how and the when a little bit harder to discern. Now, a most challenging portion of Matthew 24, verse 3, is when an anonymous one of the four disciples of Yeshua's inner circle asks, and what will be the sign that you are coming and that the Olam Hase is ending? Now, the question for us is, what was this disciple thinking and meaning about Jesus coming? See, typically, this is taken to mean Christ's return in the sense that he dies, he's resurrected, he ascends to heaven, stays there until some undetermined time in the future in which he then returns to us. Or as Christians say, the second coming. Actually, this view from where this is is quite a leap. There doesn't seem to have been any real or understandable discussions that are recorded in the Gospels about such a thing. In fact, what we'll read about after Christ's death is that the disciples were completely dispirited and figured that their movement and their hopes had ended. Yeshua, their leader, their messianic hope, was dead and gone. That was that. They were surprised upon the proof of his resurrection. And even then, we will read of the Thomas, uh, of, uh, Thomas the disciple who simply couldn't process the risen Christ standing there talking to him. He had to literally place his fingers into the nail holes on Jesus' wrists, the hole in his side from the Roman spear. Okay. The point being that if what the disciples meant and were thinking about Christ coming, the way modern believers usually take it, then their reaction to his death and the surprise at his revivification makes no sense. The only intellectually honest way I can reconcile this conundrum is if this disciple meant that he understood that Christ was going to go away somewhere for a time, no doubt alive and unchanged, and then when he decided to come back to Jerusalem as the Messiah, the end of the world would happen. So while the disciple thought of Jesus' absence in the sense of a typical earthly retreat to some place safe and remote, perhaps for a few weeks or months, maybe to Qumran with the essence, he was only incorrect in that Yeshua was actual retreat would be in a spiritual form to heaven, and that his coming back would happen many centuries later, but in an entirely different form and substance. Now, where our complete Jewish Bible says, Olam Hazeh, that Hebrew term translate into, into English as the present world or the present age. The Jews, you see, saw redemption history as a two-part structure. Part one is the Olam Haze, the present age. It comes to an end when the Messiah, the Son of Man, appears. And then part two is when immediately the world to come, the Olam Haba, appears. Now see, for them, the world was uh, to come was largely 
about Israel regaining their independence and then coming into a golden age that becomes its own empire. So the idea is that Messiah Yeshua will come in time back to Jerusalem, and when he does, the current age abruptly ends and the next age begins. And considering the urgency in which the disciples and later on the apostles barnstormed the region with the message of forgiveness of sins and that the kingdom of heaven is at hand, they could only have thought that Yeshua's absence was nearing its end. See, this two-part structure of redemption in history and the connection between the Messiah and the end times is what mainstream Judaism of that day thought. It's what the Pharisees taught. It's what John the Baptist believed to the point he had a falling out with Jesus over it. Of course, none of these folks could comprehend of Christ's return in the context of two separate visits of the Messiah with a very long period in between in which only does the second visitation of Yeshua bring us to the apocalypse and the end of human history, what Christians call the end times. See, now Yeshua didn't at first address the where, the how, of his coming back to Jerusalem. But we must never simply jump over the critical point that indeed his return is to be to where? Where is he coming back to? Jerusalem. It's not a trick question. He's coming back to Jerusalem. Indeed, the entire world will somehow look up into the sky and see him coming, but where he lands is Jerusalem. See, this destroys any notion that God is done with Israel and the Jewish people. So Christ first responds to the disciples' question with, don't be fooled. Don't be fooled. Then he goes on to list some specific things that will happen. These are not hypothetical. They're not symbols. Now, as a born skeptic, what Yeshua says isn't terribly hard for me to accept and to do, but for many more of you who are inherently trusting souls. So questioning and challenging what appears to be good and holy and obvious to others is not going to be easy for you. The first case of what is going to happen is that many false messiahs will appear, some even coming in his name, which could literally mean saying he's Jesus, or probably meaning identifying himself as God's messiah. I mean, such a scenario was actually common within the Holy Land in Yeshua's day. It was one of the reasons that the more erudite Jerusalem residents turned up their noses at Yeshua because he was just another and a long line of charlatans and claimants to the Messianic throne in their minds. Perhaps one of the most famous Messianic pretenders to come was Bar Kokhba, who appeared about 100 years after Christ. He led yet another failed Jewish rebellion against Rome and disappointed so many who were certain he was the Messiah. This series of false messiahs simply shut down the Jewish hope of a real Messiah that actually fulfilled the prophecies about him, thus making it all the harder for them to accept the true Messiah, Yeshua, who was executed. Josephus even wrote about this sad string of false messiahs that just pestered Israel. The wretched people were deluded at that time by charlatans and pretended messengers of the deity, he wrote. Now, another thing that Yeshua says looking forward is, there's going to be this constant drumbeat about wars near and far away. 
Don't be frightened, he says. This is not the end. And just for any thinking Christian, you know, it's one thing to praise God and to beseech him to return his son to us so that his kingdom can be set up forever. It's quite another when we put our hands and arms back down to our sides and then soberly understand that if we're still here, the odds of surviving the ruthlessness of the Antichrist and the terrible battles that lead to Yeshua's return are pretty slim. The Jews also understood to some level that the events involved with the Messiah's coming and the end of the world were going to be horrific. In their context, they knew Rome wasn't going to simply throw down their weapons and surrender to Israel's Messiah. Thus, Yeshua's comment to not be frightened. That was meant both for the disciples hearing him speak and then for us 2,000 years in the future. So Christ teaches his four disciples that all these wars and conflagrations that are already, they're already hearing about are going to continue to happen. But this doesn't mean the end has come. See, no matter how much this passage is taught in churches, every time there's a serious war or a terrible atrocity like 9-11 that happens, a goodly number of Christians become certain this is the signal that we've entered the end times. No one alive today fought in World War I, and precious few are alive and old enough to re remember it. But the reality that we learn of in memoirs and history books is that the horror of it caused the church in general to believe this had to be the war to end all wars. This was the biblically foretold apocalypse. There were believers that sold everything and went to live in remote places. There were small cultish groups of Christians that even committed mass suicides. What I'm telling you is that no wars or calamities that have happened to this point in history are the indicators that the end is near. I only draw the conclusion that the end times is just around the corner because of the rightness of Christ's promises with the extensive passage of time since he made them and because of the one thing that is impossible to set aside as the key to setting the stage of our Savior's return, the rebirth of Israel as a nation of Jews in 1948. Yeah, that subject's a big one in itself. It's for another time. So verse 7 says, that peoples will fight each other, as will nations fight one another. See, the Greek word that translates as peoples is ethnos. Ethnos. And although the complete Jewish Bible translation of this verse does a better job of communicating the, me the meaning than most Bible versions, the more familiar way we read this in our Bibles sounds like the King James Version, which says this in verse 7. For nations shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places. This translation gives us a wrong impression. The Greek word that is translated here as nation is ethnos. It means people or groups of people. Ethnicities, not nations. When we read kingdom against kingdom, the, great, the Greek word is basalia. It refers to political entity, entities, governments, nations. So ethnic groups and races of people, it says, will battle, battle one another. And also governments of nations will send armies of their nations to battle other nations. Now in Bible times, in general, Races and ethnicities, people groups, ethnos, did not battle. 
others over race and ethnicity. Simply wasn't an issue. Some scholars claim that there is no difference between that and tribalism. I think tribalism is quite another thing. Tribalism is, in fact, merely a rather primitive form of government. What we are seeing in our day of brown-skinned people battling those of other colors, of black-skinned people battling those of other colors, of white people doing the same only because of skin color differences, of Asians trying to defend themselves against those from other ethnicities, all on account of race and ethnic jealousies. This is actually somewhat new to the world. In the past, the ancient past, the motives for such hatred and animosities mostly had to do with religious differences or the want of natural resources or of governments of nations desiring to expand their reach and their power. What I'm saying is that ethnos against ethnos is a very nearly worldwide dynamic that has nothing or little to do with religion or governments or natural resources or land is happening now on a scale that we have not seen historically. And yet, as bothersome, as heartbreaking a reality as it happens in America and a few other places in the world, Christ says, this too must occur. But it is not the sign of the end. He moves on to other happenings that, again, Christians often take as signs of the end times, but in fact, Christ says they're not. He says there will be famines and earthquakes in various places around the world. And if these are any sign at all, it's only of the beginnings of the birth pains. Now, just so we're clear, this is a metaphor. Yeshua used all kinds of everyday occurrences to make his point. Everyone understood the birth process. How the, before a child passed through the maternal waters and was born, first the mother had the beginnings of the birth pains, those first initial twinges that could come days before the labor pains began in earnest. So this is a way of speaking about stages of the end times process and the very first stage that only warns of the imminent entry into the end times is likened to those first early twinges. The problem is that famines and earthquakes are recorded in the Bible and other ancient historical documents as far back as there is written language. Were these things happening all over the world? Were they less and fewer than they are now? There's really nothing to prove that one way or the other. <clears throat> it's only that within today's instant communications around the globe <clears throat> that knowing what's going on everywhere at once has become the norm. Where even a few decades ago, no such thing was imaginable. So we're inundated with largely negative news that has the proclivity to scare the daylights out of some and to simply exhaust others. See, what Christ is counseling among his followers is endurance and patience. Patience and endurance. Watchful waiting. Remaining devoted as the world deteriorates. It's to be expected. It's inevitable. See, such deteriorating is only abnormal in the sense that sin and evil are abnormal in relation to the perfection that God originally created everything. But in light of the way the world became immediately after Adam and Eve broke their one rule Torah, it is not abnormal for us to experience Famines, earthquakes, 
wars of governments against governments, and especially as of late, hatred and jealousies of ethnicities against ethnicities. Just as it's not abnormal for a woman to have birth pains when bringing a new life into this world. The Greek word to open verse 9 is tote. And depending on your Bible version, it's translated to either, either then or at that time. My concern, of course, is this. What time? When is then? Since all the English versions I checked did not make a paragraph change between verses 8 and 9, and since I can't find any scholars who seem to even address the meaning of at that time, that I'm kind of left to my own devices to try to figure it out. Therefore, without filtering this through denominational or traditional thoughts, it seems to me this can only be saying that upon the first twinges of the birth pains that signals entry into the end times, all that follows begins to happen. Therefore, these things listed are the initial birth pains, the first twinges. And the first twinge mentioned is believers being arrested and handed over to be punished or even put to death, and all peoples, ethnos, ethnic groups, hating God worshipers. And since this is a twinge, and therefore must occur, before the Antichrist makes his appearance, then it means that things have not fully deteriorated, at least as the world sees it, just yet. However, the, no doubt the world is merely distracted and deluded. In Yeshua's era, and even to the latest of the apostles, John, getting arrested for religious beliefs, even for mere doctrinal differences between, uh, within the same religion, that was kind of par for the course. So none of this prophecy would have had much of a surprise for Peter, James, Andrew, and John to have heard it from Christ. Now, however, for people like me, in the 21st century, only a few years ago, I could never have imagined that the, in the developed Western world, a Christian could be arrested and prosecuted for little more than speaking his or her beliefs out loud, or even within the confines of their houses of worship. Yet, that is happening right now. Speaking out against the gay lifestyle or against self-determining one's own sex apart from what is clearly biological and anatomic or pleading for women not to abort their babies, even standing with Israel. See, this has put those of us who say these things on the outside looking in. Further, because of modern hate speech laws, the freedom to hold our own biblically-based moral views and advocate for them one at a time, becoming not merely unpopular, but illegal. It's happening. But let's be clear. What will be the root cause of all this hatred against us? Christ says, it's not you, it's me. It's because of me that you're hated. The next verse says, within that same context, that many prophets will appear, that false prophets will appear, and they'll fool many people. What does Yeshua mean by prophets? See, in his day, this term had a range of meanings, from a seer to a teacher of God's word. Sometimes the term was used so generically that it carried the sense of a person representing God in some unspecified way. Now, perhaps it means to think about it is as people that some in the body of Christ give special attention and authority to. 
people who claim they know something that only the Lord's told them. People who claim they know the date Jesus is returning. People who could tell you what's going to happen tomorrow. Or simply people who teach God's word or doctrines and traditions that supposedly interpret God's word. See, in Yeshua's day, this term mostly referred to the scribes and the Pharisees. But it also included this steady stream of charlatans claiming to be the Messiah. In our day, the term false prophets mean those whom many in the church accept as having inspired insight, but God doesn't claim them at all. So how do we sort this out? How can we know who they are? See, Yeshua has already told us, and you're going to continue to hear this from me regularly, I'm afraid. Matthew 7, 15 through 23. Beware of false prophets. They will come to you wearing sheep's clothing, but underneath they're hungry wolves. You will recognize them by their fruit. Can people pick grapes from thorn bushes, figs from thistles? Likewise, very healthy, a very healthy tree produces good fruit, but a poor tree produces bad fruit. A healthy tree can't bear bad fruit, or a poor tree, good fruit. Any tree that does not produce good fruit is cut down and thrown in the fire. So, you will recognize them by their fruit. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Only those who do what my Father in heaven wants. On that day, many are going to say to me, Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name? Didn't we expel demons in your name? Didn't we perform many miracles in your name? Then I'm going to tell them to their faces, I never knew you. Get away from me, you workers of lawlessness. We'll continue next time in Matthew chapter 24. Help support God's people by purchasing items made by them. Merchandise with a meaning. Products with a purpose. HolyLandMarketplace.com For more teachings, visit, support, or donate at TorahClass.com Join with us in worship and enjoy God's word at Seat of Abraham Fellowship.